It's the appointed time, and we have a quorum. This is Stamp Duty Amendment Bill 2017 Bills Committee meeting. I call the meeting to order. This is the sixth meeting. Item number one. Let me remind members that under Rules of Procedure, Rule 83A, in relation to declaration of interest, if there is any direct or indirect pecuniary interest between members and the items under discussion, members should disclose the nature of such interest before they speak. And if members have disclosed pecuniary interest previously, they should also disclose the same interest before they speak in each subsequent meeting. Item number two. Well, on a meeting, in the meeting on the 9th of June, House Committee, members agree that uh, we will scrutinize um, stamp duty amendment number two, Bill 2017, that is, to tighten the exemption arrangements in relation to multiple residential properties under one single instrument. There will be a new round of invitation to ask members to join the Bills Committee. Shortly afterwards, the clerk will issue um, notices. Existing members do not have to indicate their preference to join again. Today, we will continue with the scrutiny of the Stamp Duty Amendment Bill 2017. Matters arising from previous meeting. Well, there is the administration's responses to issues raised at the meeting on the 5th of June. It's on it's in paper C B bracket one 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 nine stroke sixteen to seventeen bracket O two. I'll ask the administration to take us through the paper before I invite members to ask questions. <coughs> Thank you. There are a number of uh, issues raised in the last meeting. First is the twenty nine AI and twenty nine BA and the uh, drafting. Uh, we have given this is the administration's uh, draft CSA. We'll refer to it shortly. In relation to the other issues touched upon in the um, previous meeting, uh, we have a written response. Last time, members mentioned that some people may avoid payment of the new residential stamp duty NRSD by transferring shares of a property holding company. Looking into it, we find that this is not a common way adopted by the general public. As we've explained last time, uh, if members of the public hold properties in this way, they will have to take on considerable risks because the company concerned may have hidden debts or is involved in legal actions. So if they acquire a property in this way, they will take on board the debts or liabilities as well. We do believe that uh, this is not a common way adopted by the general public. The transaction uh, by transferring shares of a property holding company is still subject to stamp duty. It's um, 1%. And if uh, the IRD has suspicions that um, this is used to speculate a property, then they will follow up. And if that is the case, then the gain from property speculation will have to be charged. For um, corporations, the profits tax rate is 16.5%. And in relation to applicable um, ad valorem stamp duty rates for exchange prop properties, under Section 29A bracket 1, there is a clear de definition of what is a non-residential property and residential property. Non-residential property refers to immovable property, which under the existing condition of certain documents specified in the document may not be used wholly or partly for residential purposes. Well, uh, residential 
property refers to any immovable property other than non-residential property. If there is one instrument comprising residential and non-residential property in exchange for another instrument covering both residential and non-residential property, well, the IRD uh, use the number of instruments as the basis. If the instrument covers in residential and non-residential property and they cannot be separated, then they will all be seen as a residential property and the corresponding ad valorem stamp duty rate will be applied. That applies to exchange of several properties. If in the uh, portfolio there is a residential property, the IRD will apply the same principle and treat this as a residential property. The exchange will be seen as residential property in exchange for another residential property and corresponding at valorum stamp duty rate will be charged. In relation to the first schedule head 1 bracket 1 and head 1 bracket 1A, all parties of the instrument and all persons executing the instrument are liable for the payment of at valorum stamp duty. We would like to emphasize that uh, we have not changed anything under the current bill. Last time, members expressed a concern that um, an estate agent may sign a provisional agreement in a capacity of a witness, and they wonder whether the estate agent will be liable to pay AVD. We explained that. Um, if an estate agent just signed the agreement in the capacity of a witness, that person is not regarded as liable person. And under Section 4, bracket 3 of the ordinance, a person who uses an instrument chargeable with stamp duty shall be liable for the payment of stamp duty. Members last time mentioned that if, for some reason, the estate agent wants to use this instrument uh, to recover agent commission, then he may be liable. We have asked the um, estate agent industry. We learned that uh, this is not the way for them to recover commission. There will be a separate estate agency agreement in relation to the provision of services and um, payment of commission, so they don't need to use the instrument to recover commission. In the experience of the IRD, they have there's never been a case when uh, an estate agent is has to pay stamp duty. In relation to the date of execution of instrument, using the example cited by members, well. The IRD will refer to the date of the instrument executed by both buyer and seller. And if a provisional agreement for sale and purchase was executed by one party only on or after the 5th of November 2016, well, unless uh, an exemption arrangement applies, that is, say, for example, the buyer is a Hong Kong permanent resident and who is not a beneficial owner of any other residential property, then the instrument will be subject to the new residential stamp duty rate at 15%. That's all for my presentation. I will be happy to answer questions. Questions from members. Mr. James Toll. A number of points here. Well, the second property is 15%, and if someone wants to acquire a second property by way of um, acquiring a property to so that that person can pay a lower stamp duty, there is actually a higher incentive. So when implementing the new residential stamp duty, the administration should uh, monitor transfer of shares of property holding company, especially uh, those related 
to large amount. And in paragraph 9, I'm afraid I can't agree with the administration. They said that if you, well, you are liable to pay if you use the instrument. And you understand that uh, they have, they will sign a separate agreement. Let me explain to you why they will have to submit the uh, sale, sale and purchase agreement or the provisional one. Say, well, an estate agent uh, well um, invited you to inspect a person. Well, in the end, if a sales and purchase agreement is signed then, then you will have to pay commission. And if you rely solely on the agency agreement, that is not enough. And if they use, if the agent uses the provisional sale and purchase agreement as proof that um, the services provided that result in uh, a transaction being realized, then the agent will have to pay stamp duty. That is unfair. I don't know if I can move an amendment, but I have to say at least that this is not fair. If the administration said they can change it, that will be better. But they may say that uh, it is out of the scope of the bill. But if you promise that you will look into it, I may not move an amendment. But if you insist, then I may move a CSA. Of course, uh, if the president allows it, then I would at that would at least start a discussion amongst estate agents because they will bear risk because they may have to pay stamp duty. And if they don't use the instrument, then the parties may not pay commission. I don't suppose that you will ask the estate agent to pay simply because they have used the instrument as evidence in court. Let me see what your answer is before I proceed. So you would like to yeah, you would like to ask the IRD to answer or Perhaps uh, we will, I will ask the IRD to answer because it's not part of the uh, bill per se. It's the term. Well, all other persons executing the instrument doesn't target estate agencies, estate agents. If there is another person other than the buyer and the seller executing the instrument, there will be an avenue for us to, uh, to uh, chase payment. Normally, it doesn't target estate agents. We don't usually see them as uh, being legally liable to pay stamp duty. And the practice note said that if an estate agent uses an, inst uh, an instrument that of which uh, stamp duty is not fully paid, then the estate agent may have to pay the remaining amount. Well, Section 4, bracket 3 of the Stamp Duty Ordinance states that uh, any person who uses an instrument chargeable shall be liable for payment. And we, I don't think there is a need for us to review the situation simply because of estate agents. Just one quick re response. We are not saying that you target the 
um, estate agents. We're not saying that. But somehow he gets hit. I mean, he, he's charging commission and he wants the, uh, to use the provisional agreement as evidence. And uh, he may be hit by that. Okay, uh, Mr. Toh, I think we understand your point uh, very clearly. Can I just ask, uh, Mr. Young, um, you are also from the legal field. Um, I haven't been taking part recently in any such transactions. Now, but for provisional agreement um, going through the uh, estate agents, now, as far as I understand, the estate agent acts in the capacity of a witness. And in the past, now before we have these uh, agreements, now the same duty would be borne by the uh, purchaser and or the seller. But the estate agent is only a witness. And the IRD um, doesn't really target the estate agent if the buyer and seller do not pay up the commission or the stamp duty. And the, the lawyers also will be responsible for paying the government for the stamp duty. So, I mean, that's my understanding anyway. So, can I ask whether Mr. James Toll's concern is a genuine one? Well, 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 why do you ask him? I mean, because he's in the legal field. Because if if he speaks, then, then uh, he speaks on his behalf. You should be asking the one sitting next to you, the legal advisor. Well, I mean, we can learn from different people. I'm, I'm, I'm seeking a colleague's view. Now, if outside the meeting you can consult him, but then when it's his turn to speak, then uh, he can speak. Well, he can respond to my question. Well, as chairman, well, I can ask him. But, but chair, let, let me respond to what the government has said. Well, you have already responded. No, I, I haven't finished. You, you cut me short. Okay, okay, you, you continue. Otherwise, I will set a time limit, okay? Chair, um, paragraph 9 says that anyone who uses an instrument chargeable with stamp duty shall be liable for the payment of a stamp duty. And I was using more examples uh, in, in the, on the last occasion. Um, Sometimes, um, if the property is not vacant, and then um, if you want the incoming um, owner uh, wants to ratify the agreement, and then the the, the document or uh, instrument might be taken to the land tribunal, and if you want to recognize the tenancy, um, the, the document has been submitted to the court for once and then uh, he or she would be liable for the commission. I mean, th that would be uh, a, a big deal. Now, of course, I'm happy to give the government to, to give me a different response, maybe after this meeting. But otherwise, just based on the present re uh, response, I would like to produce a CSA and and because I, I just realized that um, those in the trade, well, to ensure fairness, they should urge the government to uh, make such an amendment. Okay, Mr. Toh, I agree. Letting you raise this issue now because based on the, uh, well, SDO amendment, Bill um, 2017. Now there is no direct um, relevance as far as I can see, because even without this amendment bill, this concern 
already existed and not as a result of the proposed 15 percent charging. Well, well the, the penalty or the amount involved is, is heavier, is 15 percent. Yes, in the past it was something like 5 percent, yes. Well, whether it's 5 percent or 15 percent, the, the, the question is the same. Yes, but 15 percent is a heavier burden than 5 percent. But this particular uh, amendment um, is not particularly new uh, for this exercise. Yes, I, I, I am informing the chairman that I would like to uh, convince the president um, to, to move such a CNSA. Okay, all right, so let's um, resume um, my question for uh, Mr. Yeung or other Mr. Leung or other members here. Can you share your experience with us? I discussed with my colleague, uh, Mr. Yeung, and let me just share with you my view. Now, I think on Mr. James Toe's point as to who would actually be paying the stamp duty. Now, Chair, now you have outlined um, a case where you have a provisional agreement signed by both buyer and seller, and then the witness is usually the estate agent. And the estate agent usually will have entered into an estate agency agreement. Now, of course, there are different estate agencies. Now, the, the rule of the trade is once the provisional agreement is signed, the commission is payable. And of course, sometimes um, they would well forego the, the agreement and leading to um, well court cases. But if the provisional agreement is signed and the commission is payable, Now, I share uh, Mr. Toh's point or his concern that anyone, any person who uses the instrument well, shall be liable for the payment of stamp duty. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Ms. Wong. Now, if you use the instrument as a kind of a litigation, as a civil case, um, it will have to be... Uh, paid a stamp duty. Now, if the estate agent is owed um, commission, but does he need to use the um, conveyance or provisional agreement to prove that something has already been done? Now, this is a kind of uh, evidence to be submitted in court, but whether or not this is admissible in court, uh, my colleague will know a little bit more. Now, to be fair, uh, Mr. Toh's concern is not invalid, but it only will happen in very exceptional cases. Has it ever happened before? Can I ask Mr. Tam of the IRB? Now, in our record, there is no such uh, case of trying to recover um, stamp duty from estate agents. Yes, from our record, there is no such uh, case um, before. Now, Mr. Toh, if he wishes to do an amendment, then you can go ahead anytime you like is your right. But can I just uh, give it another try? Now, for paragraph 8, now a question for the IRD. Do you confirm that all the other parties, okay, um, all other persons executing the instrument? Now, the estate agent, is he 
You see, one of the party involved in the executing of the instrument here it says buy and seller and or paragraph eight the third line or other persons executing the instrument is it mr tam um, but do you wish to answer the question? Now, here we we have um, all other persons executing the instrument. So, if the estate agent were to uh, sign this, then uh, he, he would be uh, caught in this. Okay, so I'll move ahead with the CSA then. Okay, any other questions on this point? Now, otherwise, we move on to um, the next one. Now, in the last meeting, we have scrutinized the clause-by-clause -clause, um, uh, scrutiny. Can I ask the legal advisor uh, whether you have any other views? Thank you, Chair. Now, on the wording, whether it's English or Chinese, uh, we have got some um, uh, views submitted, yes. Okay, now on the 9th of June, uh, members have been told that um, the government has submitted um, CSA's uh, draft, and that's paper 1117, 16 to 17, bracket 01. And then the government has prepared a markup copy. So can I ask the government to outline um, the amendment and then we can uh, have a further discussion. Yes, I'll be very brief and then my uh, law draftsman can supplement when necessary. Now, we are responding to members' question raised last time and saying that um, the wording is not particularly user-friendly, not easily understandable. So we tried to uh, make amendments, and there are four uh, changes needed. Now, first of all, we have to amend Clause 5. Now, if we were to use the uh, markup version, um, this is to propose amending 29AI. And we have said something like uh, we have uh, bracket A and B. Now we will delete it and to say that if this is a residential property, then we will charge 15%. So this is um, the part one of scale one of head one bracket one. And if the property concern is a non-residential um, property, then it's under part two of scale one of head one bracket one in the first schedule. So this says very clearly uh, when 15% will be charged and when uh, the usual DSD. Uh, would be charged. Okay, um, let, let's pause here and we ask members whether they have uh, any views. Okay, yes, please continue. And then we move on to clause six and we propose. Thank you, sir. This is uh, the proposed section of 29 AIA. This is in relation to exchange of uh, residential property and non-residential property and the stamp duty rates to be applied. First, we need to define uh, the application. If an instrument is used uh, to effect the exchange of a residential property for a non-residential property and consideration is paid or given for equality. 
what stamp duty rates are to be applied. If it is、uh, a conveyance on sale, and if、uh, consideration is paid or given, is tr-、um, then fifteen percent of new of the new residential property stamp duty will have to be. Paid, and if the consideration is in relation to non-residential property, then the original、uh, double stamp duty (DSD) is to be paid. Well, it says except as provided in Section 29A O. This ca- this sets out the exemptions. That is, the person involved in the exchange is a Hong Kong permanent resident, and at the time of the exchange. Holds no residential property、uh, that will be exempted, or and on top of that, a transfer amongst、um, close relatives will be exempted as well. So this will clarify the situation as to under what circumstances and what rates are to be paid. Please continue. Well, the other two are consequential amendments. This, these two will have to deal with、uh, sales and purchase agreement, clause seven. In twenty nine B A, after stamp duty, we delete the original、uh, B A and replaces it with a new one. That is, if it is residential property, then it will apply. The fifteen、uh, percent、uh, new residential stamp duty, if it is non-residential, is the original DSD. Any questions? If not, continue. Clause eight. This、uh, is consequential to clause six under exchange. Twenty nine B A B is rewritten. In an exchange. Between residential property and non-residential property, the scale of rates applicable. First, when will this section apply? There should be an agreement that provides for an exchange of a residential property for a non-residential property, and consideration is paid for equality. Similarly. Except as provided in Section Twenty Nine B G, it corresponds to Twenty Nine A O. If equality money is to be paid by the recipient of the residential property, then it has to be paid. The、uh, new residential property stamp duty fifteen percent has to be paid. And if the consideration is paid by the、uh, by the other party, then it is like、um, purchase of a non-residential property. Then the original DSD applies. It clarifies the、uh, situation after with this amendment. If there are no questions, let's continue. Well, on the ninth of June, members have been informed that、uh, Mr. James Toll would、uh, submit dr- draft CSAs. It's、uh, CB bracket. One one zero nine five stroke sixteen to seventeen bracket o one. I asked Mr. Toh to go through the CSAs, and then I'll ask the administration to reply. Then, then we will see if members have any questions, and we'll seek advice from the legal advice as well. There are two. Part here first is a guarantee in place of payment. That is, using a bank guarantee 
of an amount equal to the difference. The second one is to extend the time limit for disposal of the original property. If you buy first, then you will have to pay 15%. Originally, the limit is six months. Uh, I have two versions in my amendment. So, two versions, A and B. One is uh, six to nine months. The other one is six months changed to 12. Before I explain, well, I uh, mentioned previously something about the the one who executes the agreement. Say, for example, the estate agent, whether they will be liable. I may move an amendment. So I give you notice that uh, after the meeting, I may circulate my new amendment. Let me explain. First, using a bank guarantee of an amount equal to the difference instead of uh, payment. If the IRD is satisfied that the buyer will make an application for re refund of the difference between stamp duty payment uh, under the new residential stamp duty and uh, scale 2, then uh, the buyer may produce a bank guarantee under the banking ordinance to the IRD and if an application for refund is made and approved then the bank guarantee is dismissed. This is in Annex 1. The second part is change from six months to nine months. The second version is from six months to 12 months. It means that Well, let me put it this way. In the letter, I use the word may, may be extended to, uh, the word may is uh, wrong, it should be shall, and I apologize. That means uh, if the uh, conditions are satisfied, then the director shall extend the time limit from six months to nine months in version A or six months to 12 months under version B. You will find uh, the wording of the amendment in Annex 2. Well, I don't ask for a resolution to be endorsed here to ask um, the chairman to do it. So a member has given us notice that uh, he will give us a CSA draft. Firstly, to allow bank guarantee in view of uh, an actual payment of the NRSD. The second one is in relation to extending the time limit to 9 or 12 months. Any response from the administration? There is one actually is bracket one 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 nine stroke sixteen to seventeen bracket O three. Yes. 
First, let me apologize that uh, we only issue the response today because we need time to look in carefully into it. There are three areas. First, policy consideration. In this regard, we have had a lot of discussions. We understand that members may want to help people who buy before they dispose of the original property. We fully understand that. In previous meetings, we have explained the concern of the administration. Any change may send a wrong message to the market that uh, the cooling measures will be watered down. We've had a lot of discussion, so I'm not going to repeat the, our stance. We respect members' wish. And two, we think that Mr. Toll's amendment may be out of the scope of the bill. We understand that in the end it's for the president to decide. When we look at the scope of the bill, we take into account the long title, the explanatory memorandum, and the provisions, the logical brief, and other factors. The long title, the explanatory memorandum, made it very clear that the object of the bill is to change the percentage. In the logical brief and in the first reading speech of the secretary, that all exemption arrangements and refund mechanisms continue to remain unchanged. We have said this many times, and we've emphasized that we have no intention to change anything. If we are to change any arrangements in relation to exemptions, it will be out of the scope of the bill. Well, that's why we have to introduce a new bill to deal with the acquisition of multiple residential properties under a single instrument. That's the view of the administration. In the end, it's for the president to decide. Drafting aspect. Our colleagues from the uh, drafting division has uh, looked into it. I would defer to them. Mr. Toll's proposed amendment relies on Section 29 DF. Well, the uh, original Definition, say, for example, subject property specified amount are to be applied in context of the provisions. If Mr. Toe wants to move uh, to 29AI, say, in subsection 1 is about the applicable rates, and if in subsection 2, all of a sudden there is subject property, specified amount, original property. Then one will not know about the uh, clear definition and the actual arrangement. Legal advisor, any views from you uh, regarding Ms. James Toe's uh, proposed amendment? Now, regarding uh, Mr. Toe's proposed CSA um, on the scope and drafting, we have already provided my views to Mr. Toe. So let me just uh, summarize. Now, on the scope, the overall scope, I think ultimately it's for President um, to rule. Now, but as far as I can see, my personal view is that um, the proposed um, CSA 
lies outside the scope of the bill because the bill uh, focuses on the 15% uh, charge for residential properties. Now on the drafting, maybe I can just make one point. Now the proposed increase from 6 to 9 months or 6 to 12 months. Now in 29DF, there is no mechanism to allow for such an extension. So from the ILD's viewpoint, now within the six month period, if you buy first and then you sell, now whether the selling takes place within six months of uh, buying, and there's no mechanism to extend the, the six months to any uh, other period. If you want to add in this extension, and if you look at past rulings by the president, this may become an additional power given to the ILD. And there may be a charging effect as a result of that. Now, the uh, other views have already been uh, given to Mr. To. Um, uh, yes, Mr. To, uh, your response, please. No. Okay, so this is my response to the government's response. Now, first of all, on the policy consideration. Now, because um, the government is now proposing a 15% charge and uh, my proposal does not weaken or undermine the government's policy but it is the um, impact that the government's proposal will have on the buyers so the the aim is not to undermine the um, the effect of the government's uh, proposal regarding the 15% charge. Now, second point on the technical side, whether it exceeds the scope of the bill. I understand that we have to convince the president, so we have to um, well take reference from past uh, scenarios. Now. We have seen in the past that, okay, now let's say t this time we have a proposal from government to impose a 15% charge. We have to convince the president that uh, any proposed CSA here is directly relevant rather than something which is not relevant or only relevant to a small degree. Now, at the end of the day, this is for the president to rule, and we have to wait and see. Now, but I believe that the points I am proposing are relevant. Now, thirdly, um, on the scope, and then uh, if the government's view is that. Um, um, the one instrument for more than one properties already lies outside the scope. Now, but this, and so they have to introduce another bill. Now, this is their own narrow interpretation because that's their own interpretation, um, a binding their own action. But is this really an objective um, interpretation? And is this narrow interpretation the only one? And I uh, beg to differ. Now, the the government's um, interpretation is uh, obvious. Now, but for one instrument covering many properties, now is it not related to the fifteen percent ruling? Well, I have a, a different view. Now, finally, now the government's legal advisor is saying that the twenty nine DF uh, section. Uh, if we were to use it this way, is not very uh, clear. Now, I have to look at this uh, very ca carefully because I only received this today. So maybe there are some amendments uh, necessary. Okay, I'm only looking at it just now. So finally, I just want to re repeat that now for the parties involved in the execution, 
I will try to make a third uh, amendment. Now, because the government is only giving us this response today, and I'm taking it as a definitive answer from the government, and and um, members uh, should be allowed to uh, make further CSAs. Now, I hope, Chair, you will give us a few more days um, before reporting to the House Committee. So I will have at least a few days uh, to prepare my uh, amendment. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Mr. Chong, I understand the government explanation about the scope involving the 15%. Now, the 15% act affects the, the uh, buying and selling sentiment because the amount involved is substantial and that you have to give the buyer uh, more time. Now, in the past, when you're talking about 5% or 8%, then it is basically uh, easier because the amount involved is smaller. And now, because of the 15%, uh, half a year may not be enough. So I am in favor of uh, extending it to 12 months, yes extension to 12 months. So this also involves the bank guarantee uh, moved by or, or mentioned by Mr. To. Now, I'm asking you, Mr. To, that you have in, you have mentioned the amendment on the parties to the execution. Now, have you submitted this to the secretary? And uh, there is no need to have another meeting because of this. Well, I have no firm proposal, uh, Chair. Okay, I I'm just making a suggestion. Do you agree? My proposal is not to have another meeting. No, I, I haven't made any such proposal. I, I originally intended to have a, a circular or, or do it by circulation, yes. Okay. Now let us now look at the timetable. I'm asking the government and members whether you agree to the um, the timetable of the 23rd of June to be submitted to House Committee, and you have time to do the third uh, amendment regarding parties to the extension. Uh, parties to the execution, and then resumption of second reading, um, the 26th of June, and then announcement for the CSA um, for all the members, um, 3rd of July, and then resumption of second reading debate. Um, the 12th of July. Uh, when is the de deadline for me to submit my work? The 3rd of July. Yes, you have time to do your amendments or CSAs. Now, if members and the government agree uh, on the resumption of second reading date, So the uh, the administration will uh, take note of this and prepare accordingly. Okay. Okay. We can now move on to uh, AOB. Now, because of the House Committee meeting on the 9th of June, this uh, committee's member members will um, also scrutinize. Um, the number 2017 stamp duty amendment bill number 2 um, 
to invite other members to join uh, if they so wish. Uh, the existing members, of course, uh, will be transferred to this new committee uh, automatically. Oh, of course, if you want to withdraw, and you have the right to do so any time. Now, I'd just like to let you know that we're going to in invite uh, or to inform members to join after the merger of the committee. And the next meeting for this combined committee would be held on Tuesday, 4.45 to half past six on the 20th of June, 2017. All right. Now, members, if you do not have any other views, um, I will adjourn the meeting today. And um, this brings this uh, scrutiny of the bill to a close. Thank you.